Welcome to Something to Talk About. I have the great pleasure to have Doug the Great. Now, this is being recorded live to air in a basement in Brantford, Ontario, and it's an old house, and the basement's not necessarily tall, so I don't know how you got in here with stilts, (laughs) and more importantly, you're also a juggler, so I have no clue how the heck you're going to juggle in this confined space. Uh, but welcome, Doug. Well, thank you. I'm also a magician, so it's all an illusion. It is all an <laughs> thank illusion. Thank you, Robert. Thanks you for know, the opportunity. You know, everything we do is an illusion in many <laughs> cases, isn't it? So uh, today we're actually going to be doing a little bit of a, a chat about uh, Doug the Great and uh, some of the stories that Doug has, and I've been fortunate to hear a few of them over the years. Uh, but this is all going to raise awareness to the Participation Support Services, uh, which is funded through uh, the Hamilton, Niagara, uh, Niagara Haldeman Brandt local uh, Health Integration Network, which is a big, big word, which is the H-N-H-B-L-H-I-N. Who came up with this? <laughs> oh, my Lord. In any case, uh, tell me, first of all, a bit about uh, participation support services. Well, um, I can tell you a lot uh, because I started it started there when it first opened. So back in 1978, um, it was, um, I guess there's parents in town that had young children with cerebral palsy, and their concern is what's going to happen to them later on in life. Where would they live? Uh, Because at that time, and we're going back to the 60s, um, a lot of children would go to large institutions. And so um, a group came about called the the Parent Council, the CP Parent Council, Cerebral Palsy Parent Council. They were a member of the Ontario Federation for Cerebral Palsy. And uh, around that time, they... um, Clarence Myers, who was the executive director of OFCP, Ontario Federation, uh, he had a son with cerebral palsy, and he he, uh, developed this idea called a participation house. And so the very first one was in the Markham, and I believe that was probably in the uh, late 60s that that came about. And so that was a pilot project, and uh, then these smaller groups picked up on that and thought that would be great uh, to have more of a home uh, at home in the area. And so uh, that's sort of how uh, it got started. Uh, In fact, when I was in the community college at Conestoga College, uh, I was taking recreational leadership. Um, I heard about the participation house um, idea and uh, was able to get a placement at the Markham uh, PH, we called them back there. And uh, that's where I sort of got interested in our organization and uh, got in at the ground floor. In fact... Uh, I was so interested and enthused about maybe working um, in uh, as a career. I uh, worked on construction for a while, helping to build Participation House in Brantford. And so if we ever went for a tour, I could show you some mistakes I made. <laughs> but uh, anyways, that's how I got started. And uh, I've been there for uh, 40 years, um, had many different jobs there. Um, today, I'm the Director of Fundraising, Marketing, and Volunteer Services. How appropriate is that, that you're here <laughs> talking about that given your current role, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Now, you, you recently did some rebranding there as well. Uh, is the overall goal of the future changing at all to go with that rebranding? Well, or? yeah. Well, it happened. Um, our executive director, Sherry Kerr, has been with us for almost 10 years, has really made a lot of changes, really positive changes for the organization and uh, found some gaps in the community. And so we've grown in 10 years, not only being a home in uh, organizations supporting adults with cerebral palsy, but now we have transitional care, uh, we have different disabilities, we have um, outreach, uh, we, uh, we have an apartments. Uh, so a lot of things that we even have, uh, we're supporting seniors because the t- kind of staff, frontline staff we have, can cater to those needs. And what Sherry found, there was some lacking in the community. F- for instance, uh, as we know at our hospital, sometime it can be overflowing. And part of the problem is uh, people don't really need to be there, but where do they go? And so uh, that's uh, with that, uh, I, ge- I guess we involved into more of a service organization as well as a home, and thus uh, changing the name to more reflect of the kind of service that we provide today. So it's so obviously still rooted in, in the core goal at the beginning, but you know, you're, you're diversifying based on, on need, which is, well, that's just good business. Well, exactly. And um, uh, I've been there for 40 years. Uh, believe it or not, we have a few um, of our residents who have been there since I started as well. Because really? it's the best place for them. I guess best place for me too. But uh, <laughs> best, uh, it uh, it meets a need. And uh, I'm not sure where else these guys could go. It's a, 
it's a home and a true. They, it's like a family there. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, if they, uh, some of our guys, if they remove out into their own apartment, it may be a tough situation being alone. So it's like being away from your family, uh, especially you have if you have cerebral palsy. So, you know, anybody's invited to come and see the place and tour the place and see some of our um, other uh, establishments and, and what we do and that, and it gives you a better idea. You know, we um, a lot of people have me come and talk to their uh, groups and that, and I, I get away from talking about the bricks and mortar, but uh, talking about individuals, where they've been, uh, where they're now, where they are now, and where they're going, and that's what we're all about is opportunities. Um, I think the greatest weakness with some individuals is not being physically challenged, but being environmentally challenged and not having opportunity. Uh, So uh, when I was younger, when they were younger, they were put in the uh, institutions and people thought taking them away from the community and providing everything in this institution was the the best way. But what you're really doing is uh, taking them from a normal lifestyle and setting them up on like a conveyor belt, uh, whereas you get up at this time, you toilet at this time, you eat at this time, and you go to bed at this time. And if you go anywhere, you go where the institution decided you're going in a big bus. And so all the decision-making was taken away. So I found uh, when I uh, first started working at, at and then was called Participation House, the biggest disability wasn't having uh, being physically challenged. It was being environmentally challenged and not having the opportunity to make your own decisions. So I tell people when they decide, um, when we've had meet people move out into an apartments or back to where they're originally from, uh, we know we've done the right thing when they decide that, and we didn't decide that. So if they're making their own decisions, then we must be doing something right where we've empowered them to be themselves and to take their own responsibility and go on in life. So that's what we're all about. So it, everybody's different. And like I said, some people are still there, and we've had people over the years move out and, and have their own apartments and more normal lifestyle, live in the community. Yeah, one, one, of, one of the things that comes up a lot when I uh, talk to people during the day is the short game versus the long game. And in some of these cases, it's truly a long game uh, to get them from point A to point, you know, where they are now. And right. I think, and as you say, in the old system, it's so much easier to just regimentize it and put it on a schedule and operate it like a factory and it's done. But there's no real uh, rehabilitation. I can't say the word properly. But rehabilitation. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, and I, I found um, uh, people like to push this um, being involved in the community and making the community accessible. And, and uh, you know, we had a bank. It was a Royal Bank uh, just on uh, down at the end of Mount Pleasant on uh, Colburn Street there. It's where Tim Hortons is now. Uh, and people are upset because I had such a hard time getting some of our residents through the double doors and then the counter was high and I remember someone saying you should write a letter to the editor and say that's not called for and you know there's people who are physical and, and what I found you know the best thing and I learned this from a placement at Blurview uh, Children's Center in uh, Toronto was just exist just go see people uh, how you're challenged um, to um, do what everybody else does because people don't realize and when they see uh, that you're um, you're, you're having uh, some problems getting in or being challenged on what you're needing to do. Uh, human nature is, let's help you. And so what happened is the bank saw that we were struggling getting in and the, uh, uh, trying to go around the counter to talk to the teller. Uh, they made the changes themselves. So instead of writing a nasty letter to the editor, I turned out, uh, I went to uh, and got a plaque made up and presented them, say, thank you very much for supporting us. So I think, you know, it's not just opportunity for our residents, it's opportunity for the community, and we, we learn and grow together. So the more like, for instance, the Wingretzky Sports Center, I used to take uh, some of our residents to the, the, the pool there, the aquatic mm-hmm. center at the time, and they only had, um, and I think it's still there, the this warm... This is before the new pools. This yes, is, okay. yeah, they only had like a little area... Uh, like a jacuzzi bath area for, and then they even had a line there, and we were staying on the one side. And then they had a special events person or a special needs person there for us. And I said, "Well, we have one of our residents that competes, and we need to get one of the lanes." So they then they they gave us one lane to practice in. Well, after doing that a couple of years and not complaining, but just going and doing the best we can, they themselves decided, "Well, this is silly. Why can't they come just on family night?" Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. But again, uh, you know, I've learned over the uh, the best way to um, the, to make friends and to be part of the community is to exist in the community and let people see for themselves 
uh, and they get to know our residents. And the more you get to know um, someone who's challenged, the more you get to know them as a person. And uh, that's, I think, the great thing about our organization is it's giving everybody an opportunity, uh, which um, we shouldn't take for granted. Yeah. Well, one of the previous podcasts that we talked about was the social business hangout and the tenant there was social business. And a lot of what yeah. we talk about there is how do you integrate what you do as a business with the people in the business, with the community, uh, extend those cycles, right? Like uh, you mentioned, Sherry, she's a Rotarian, if I'm not mistaken, the right? Past so, president. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And she also does the air show. I, I believe that's Chair what, person of the air show. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, so these, these are names in the community that are constantly giving. Uh, you know, and it's the up to, I believe, the, the community and the other businesses to kind of step up their game as well in some right. cases, right? So we talked a bit, obviously, about what you do day to day. Uh, and I know, uh, based on talking to, to you and, and to some of your friends, uh, it, it's part of who you are. It, you know, it doesn't, it's not a nine to five job. You go and, you know, you're going at other hospitals, uh, uh, you know, as a fun troop, you know, like you're constantly in that space. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, we just talked briefly when I, I came over is um, um, you didn't realize I had a sister with Down syndrome. And Valerie was uh, uh, probably the reason for my career uh, in many ways. And even in getting into magic and different things, uh, I was the youngest of um, three sons. My parents came from Birmingham, England. My dad was actually the first golf pro at Northridge. Really? And um, so, and then we had uh, Valerie. I was born with uh, Down syndrome. Um, I think I was six at the time. And because of that, because of both my parents had to work, um, I, I didn't get to go and get, uh, go to dances at high school and different things. I was the one that needed to, it's always the youngest, uh, stick with my sister and uh, keep an eye out. And I was kind of jealous of her, of her at one point because it was keeping me away from mm -hmm. different things. It's probably but, as you get old, as you got older too. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was the best thing that happened to me because uh, through her, um, I became a volunteer in training uh, with the Parks Board because uh, my dad wanted, uh, uh, rather, my mom wanted Valerie to be in the community and doing things, and so um, we got her into a day camp at Mohawk Park. But they wouldn't let her go alone, and my dad had retired from golf, but he was working for the Parks Board. Was like. Um, his later years, a superintendent at uh, Mohawk Park. And so he knew about this day camp. And so I would drive up with him and my sister because mom didn't want sis to be alone. Mm -hmm. So big brother had to go with her. And that was through her um, that uh, I, uh, because of that, I eventually became a camp leader and then a camp director. In fact, I met my wife there because she worked there as well. In fact, I hired her, my wife, Katie, and at that point in my life, I was her boss. And now she's yours. Yeah, <laughs> and we got married and that changed. <laughs> yeah. And, but it was through Valerie that led me into, um, uh, into magic because um, we needed things to do at day camp. And so I started doing uh, little tricks here and there that I was in. My... So there's another story behind that, but that's how I, um, uh, through Valerie, it led me into um, a career in um work at therapeutic recreation and career in working with special needs. So I owe it all, all to Valerie. Uh, the magic part had a lot to do with my dad uh, because I was so shy as a young boy. I, uh, I didn't speak uh, at all. I was just too, and my dad couldn't figure it out, become, uh, you know, being uh, a brummy from Birmingham. And he was so outgoing. Is, is, that, is that what you call him? Brummies. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from Birmingham. He was so outgoing. Uh, and my, so were my two older brothers. He couldn't figure me out. Uh, but being a caddy in England, that's how he became a golf pro. Mm -hmm. uh, he learned that he had um, a big family, and so they all had to not finish school, but caddy next door. There was a golf course. And as well as caddying, they all learned how to juggle golf balls for something to do. They were bored, and he'd throw them and see how many you could get going. So he taught me how to juggle. We lived out near Glen Morris, and we always had pear trees and apples, and he taught me how to juggle uh, to build up some confidence. So that's how... I got started in uh, uh, that kind of magic and entertainment and later on in life, still walking. And so. Well, I know, I know why you went to still walking, and we'll get to that. But uh, just to, to, to cover the magic, so it started with magic. Well, it actually started with juggling. It started with juggling, okay. And then, um, uh, be, and then 
I was a member of the Wolf Cubs, and we had a talent night. So, so was then, I, by the way. So, what's that? So was I. Oh, were you? Great. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my uh, dad got me a library book on uh, a couple of tricks and uh, found there was a thing called an egg bag that I use today to make an egg disappear. And my mom made the So my very first trick was doing this, uh, making an egg disappear in a bag. And and I love that so much. I almost got into ventriloquism and some other things. But, uh, yeah. Did you, uh, did, did you ever actually uh, try it? The, the ventriloquism? Uh, I tried, uh, but I got bored with myself. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, it was, it's a tough one. And, oh, uh, but I, I, I love the idea of these wooden figures and the looking how they were constructed and things. But most magicians, believe it or not, were interested in that. I find a lot of my friends all had an interest in that. Uh, one guy that's really good in the area is Barry, um, uh, Barry O in, uh, uh, in Paris. He's very, uh, he's a very good ventriloquist. I, I may have to actually reach out to him and get him on this. I guess yeah. I, I want to hear more about oh, that. Oh, yeah, he's good. Uh, yeah. He could have his dummy talk to you. Well, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. I think that would be <laughs> hilarious just to, to, just to yeah. have the mic on the dummy and not even mic him. But you know what I mean. Yeah. The, uh, okay, so, so the juggling I get. Uh, the magician, obviously, you know, as you say, it was a means of communication for you. Yeah. Uh, but I'm sure, you know, that there was... Uh, the unknown and the making it happen because I I know some of the tricks that you do it, it involves a lot of practice like yeah I, um you know because I was still shy at the time I became a bit of a mime mm. because uh, you don't talk mm. right and mm. it helped me express and uh, you were talking be with creative. your hands in the motion I remember up. um at Linden Park Mall walking around with a white face doing a few balloon animals and uh, at, at different places and then I I grew out of that but yeah yeah so um uh, magic, there's no end. Yeah. Uh, you can never, in juggling too, you, you're never there. I had a friend once, um, well, a guy, uh, we used to have a clown conference in Bradford, the Spring Clown Conference. A guy by uh, Leon Buttons McBride told me this. He was with Ringland Brothers, a famous clown. And uh, he uh, said, uh, always be like a plant and be green. Because you know, when plants uh, become ripe, and when you think you're there, that's when you start to rot. So I, I remember that. So he was saying, because uh, I never felt I was there, you know, and he says, that's a good thing. You got to keep working and keep practicing and you'll, you'll find where your, your, your capabilities are and you keep working at them. And that's the fun of it all, isn't it? And I was saying that same thing to Randy when we were talking about the podcasting. I still mess up. And I've oh, done yeah. like, you know, 300 of these things, right? It, it, you're, it's just a constant, constant, you know, uh, improvement and bettering and better gear and whatnot. Uh, I want you to share the story of uh, there was a magic trick you learned to do uh, and you met your idol. I believe the story was that you saw this magic trick on TV. You learned how to do it. Oh, and then, you met it, and then he told you the truth. Right. I uh, you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the um, actually I do a talk uh, to careers, grade 10 and many of the high schools in the area. And uh, the talk is about failing forward. And um, so it's about uh, attitude and not giving up and um, not counting yourself out. And the idea was, I remember watching uh, the Ed Sullivan show. Now, I have to explain, even to the teachers today, I don't know who Ed Sullivan is. It's a theater, isn't it? Yes. That David Letterman, who's yeah. now retired, and it's Colbert's place now. Right, is that yes. that one? Right. Yes, it is. <laughs> and he was a terrific... Um, uh, producer, director, and the, he was the talent MC. Talent scout, too. T- well, that's where he was very yeah. talented because you were either famous when you are on his show or you would be famous. He's like America's Got Talent mm-hmm. at the time. And, um, you know, if you hadn't heard of Ed Sullivan, uh, people have heard of Elvis Presley. Um, was there in uh, 57, a year after I was born, singing I'm Nothing But a Hound Dog, and so the rest is history there. And the Beatles, who just had their 50th anniversary a couple of years back, of uh, the Ed Sullivan Show started their North American tour on that show. And so you know who Ed Sullivan is, the kind of uh, groups he had. But he had another individual on uh, from Switzerland named Pavel. And Pavel did what they did called back then micro magic. And I'd never seen as a young child watching it. And I used to plead when my parents let me stay up to watch. It was on Sunday nights. It was a school night, right? But they always, he always had variety acts like juggling or ventriloquism, uh, marionette and, and um, circus arts, as well as the singing. Well, there was but still I, a vaudeville flair even at that era. Right, all the great comedians. Uh, but anyways, uh, that one night he was on and I was so impressed with him. I'd never seen, I've seen like the big box magic, the illusion magic where they cut a girl in half and things. And, you know, it's sort of like a puzzle. But this stuff... And they didn't have camera tricks back then. He was doing it right in front of the camera with people watching, and I couldn't believe it. And I was so impressed. Um, I, 
I wanted to be just like him. And Dad says, well, watch one of his tricks, and maybe you'll be able to pick it up. Yeah, there was and no it, YouTube back there to watch yeah, it Yeah, I was telling you that. The kids <laughs> yeah. say, why don't you YouTube it? <laughs> no. no. You had to physically get up. We only had four channels. You had to yeah. physically get up and turn the channel. Yeah. And we had an antenna outside. And my, my That's how I got into maybe doing stunts. My <laughs> brothers used to me climb up this 40-foot tower to try to get the antenna just right in a storm outside. But anyways, uh, I digress. But uh, so uh, when... Uh, I saw that. I started working on one of the tricks to tie a knot one hand, and I failed so many times. I th- if I was, I'd throw it away and walk the other way, not be failure. And I say failing forward if you keep trying, because you're never a failure if you keep trying. Uh, doesn't matter how long it takes. It's all to do with attitude. You know, Edison said, our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to achieve is try one more time. So my whole life is trying one more time. That's what I tell the students. And I finally came up with a solution to the problem, how to tie a knot by manipulating it. And I was so thrilled with myself. Uh, it, it sort of was the beginning of my magic career because mm-hmm. I could do this. And then well, I, it was a self-taught trick, too, yeah, which is yeah, no, I didn't. in its own right. I thought that's all the way you did it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, so then I uh, went back to the library and got books, and then I discovered a club in Hamilton. There's clubs for everything, and it's called the Hamilton Magic Wand Club. If anybody have heard of Doug Henning, a mm-hmm. great magician, when I was a young guy, uh, he lived in the Ancaster area. He was a member of that club. So now we call it the Doug Henning Magic Wand Club, Ring 49 of the International Brotherhood of Magicians, international organization, started in Edmonton, Canada, believe it or not. Uh, anyways, I'm a, I'm a, I was a member at the time, and I heard Pavel was coming uh, to Canada. Uh, he was on tour. He's a master magician. He was uh, teaching now in uh selling books and whatnot. He was too old to actually perform. He must have been in his 80s. Oh, I have to go see him. So I made sure I was there at this Toronto club, another club, and I met him before his lecture. He says, Mr. Pavel, I saw you on the Ed Sullivan show back in the 60s. You were terrific. You were doing this micro magic. I know we call it close-up magic, and you're doing these incredible things with rope like I've never seen before and coins and cards. And In fact, I got my magic started because of you. That's why I'm the, with the Magic Wand Club, and I'm doing shows now, and it was because of why. He was so thrilled with that. He was taken aback, and he says, my God, you know what? After my lecture, I want you to come over. Uh, we're going out with the boys. I'm going to treat you. So I got a free meal, and the grade 10 boys love that. And uh, I showed him the, tr- the trick that he did on TV, and he almost fainted. He says, what the heck are you doing there? I says, well, that's your trick, isn't it? He says, you're using a real rope. I says, well, didn't you? No, I used a trick rope. You want to buy one? Nine ninety nine. dollars Oh, my God. I wasted three my years of my life trying to figure this out, and I could have just bought the rope. He says, oh, no, that's great. And then, uh, so that's part of my talk about now to the uh, students. I tell them at the end of why did I show them, and then I go on to do a bunch of other trick rope things. But I tell them, I know to you that's a silly little knot that I just tied with one hand. But to me, it was a life-changing experience. It sort of taught me, if I hadn't figured that knot out, I may not have been a magician today. Mm -hmm. And so all I'm saying is don't count yourself out because the trouble with young people today that I'm afraid of is they count themselves out before they even attempt. So and that that has a lot to do with confidence and attitude. And so... um, you know, uh, failing is a failure is just a process failing. It, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be the end result. So you can learn from that. And then also there's so many other things you can learn on how to succeed because sometimes you can't do it on your own. And I tell them that's why you need your teacher. And the harder you work, the harder he works. He's just there for your benefit. And so I've over the years learned to surround myself with experts. Now, uh, part of that talk is about a world record. I know you're going to ask me about that. Yep. Can go, I just go, go right go in? Right yeah, in? yeah, yeah, go right in. Uh, because that's part of my talk. Um, when I hurt my knee, and we can talk about that later, um, it was um, my physiotherapist, Tom Rollins, de- uh, and I decided, let's go after a world Actually, record. let me ask you a question. Yeah. How did you hurt your knee? I've always been meaning to ask. Oh, my goodness. It's uh, sort of embarrassing. I want to know. Uh, I was, uh, I dropped from a helicopter on the Alps. No, <laughs> <laughs> with skis. Yeah. No, I was at the Sanderson Center here in Brantford. Uh, my daughter was dancing with Mickey's Dance Connection, and it was a year-end recital for all our daughters and our kids. And the dads, of course, can't get backstage and uh, do anything with the daughters, so we used to watch. And we decided one night we should dance. So I know a lot of dads do it, but I bet you we invented it. So this was back in uh, 1970, no, 1960-something, 60, no, 
the uh, 1990, it's the 90s, it was 96. So 1996, uh, at the Sanderson Center, we decided that we were do um, a dance. Now, Mickey Caramelli, who was the, uh, the teacher at the time, didn't know. And I knew some of the guys backstage at the Sanderson Center. He says, at this time, turn off the lights, close the curtains, and tell the teacher and the audience we're having technical difficulties. We'll be right back. So they all stop, and that was our cue to come out. And we played, hey, Mickey, you blow my mind. Well, little did I know it was, hey, Mickey, uh, blow my knee. <laughs> and so I came out with a bunch of dads. We're in tutus, and we're doing this little dance. And uh, we were all running up to the uh, front through these... Um, pom-poms that I got from all the high schools. In that time, cheerleading wasn't popular, so I had to go to every high school to find my pom-pom. So we were doing pom-poms, and all you had to do is run through the pom-poms like a football player and do a pose. Yeah. And I remember my daughter was pretty good back then. She could do a Russian jump. And so as I'm running, I thought of it at that point, I'm going to do a Russian jump, and that's how I hurt myself because oh. I don't know how to do a Russian jump. I came down on all my weight on my right oh. knee, yeah, that would do and uh, you know how your knee bends yeah. one way? My knee now bends the other way. And you heard this big pop, and I know you've watched cartoons where you see the stars going around you. Yeah. That really happens. So um, I really hurt myself, and nobody knew it. No. And I got up, and I, I must have been the pain. I fainted, uh, and one of the dads picked me up, and he marched me off, and I, I believe they told me I got a standing ovation. They thought that was the funniest pratfall they all ever saw. And then uh, I found out, I thought I just sprained my knee, but I found I, uh, I disintegrated the main ACL ligament, um, I ripped some muscle apart and wrecked it, and there's some other problem, meniscus problems. And there was a Dr. Waitley uh, who did the uh, sort of scope, which was uh, new at the time, and I know he did it in the morning, and then in the afternoon he came and saw me, and then he recognized me because I had been doing a lot of stilt walking with the uh, Canada Day parades mm -hmm. and whatnot. Yeah, you had already been stilt walking at this point. Yes, yeah. no, I was, uh, the next day I was supposed to be at Port Colburn uh, after the accident. This was some time after. He recognized, he says, you're Doug DeGrate. You are wonderful. You can do these high kicks and stuff. We just love you. And then he said, oh, I got to put on my doctor's face now. And he said, oh, uh, we got to change your name. I says, what? what? Well, you, you can't be Doug DeGrate anymore. You just don't have to settle with Doug. And I said, what happened? So he told me the worst news. He says, gosh, you have no ACL. You're missing. I had to, we got to go in again, and we got to remove uh, muscle from your joint. That's why you can't chain, um, straighten up your knee. You really did a number. And I'm thinking you had trouble with your knee. Uh, that was, it was like a time bomb. There was something that was going to go. And uh, then you really did it. And uh, we can talk about operations and uh, so that led me on to, um, the, the, that's another story, going back to participation support services, participation house at the time. About two weeks later after that, I was so depressed and angry because he more or less said, you're never going to be tall again in your mm -hmm. life. You know, be five, you might as well just be a birthday. Let alone a record holder. <laughs> yes, you're done. And so, well, I didn't know about the record at yeah. that time, but I remember going to work thinking, geez, I spent all this money on these stilts from, they're from Orlando, Florida, or they use at Disney, and all these outfits. And, you know, back then, whenever you mentioned um, stilts uh, throughout, not just in this area, my name would come up mm -hmm. because I'd come up with uh, different characters. I worked for the Toronto Blue Jays when they were good. So... Um, I've worked uh, with the um, Maple Leafs. I've worked at casinos. I've done all these big jobs. It wasn't so much the money. It was just the opportunity to, to work in some of these, um, uh, the, um, the, the Rogers Center, all mm -hmm. these the different Sky places. Dome at the time. Yeah, yeah. The Sky Dome. Uh, actually, let me back up to yeah. you. Yeah, sorry. I, I, no, 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 no. That's all good. Because I, uh, I know the story, and I want to make sure I, I, I cover it. Uh, the reason you decided to still walk was to stand out from the crowd, if I remember correctly. Exactly. Being only five foot five, I was doing quite well juggling. I was working in Toronto at uh, Queen's Park. I think it was Canada Day. And I uh, had a small little crowd. I was doing uh, balancing stuff on my chin and that. And then this lady walked by, and she had a huge crowd, but she was on stilts. And I thought, oh, my goodness. And I know it's... Um, Madam Buskerfly, who's still performing today. Christy Heath, who's become a really good friend. Her actually her sons go to one of her sons go to university here in town. So um, I thought, that's it. That's how you get up on stage. Because I wasn't a stage performer, but that gives you that's how it gives, I you you are your stage. Yeah, and I thought I'd be doing magic um, on stilts, but I found that the better thing is most of the people at that time, there wasn't a lot of stilt walkers around, were dressing up like um 
uh, uh, ringmaster mm-hmm. or a clown, mm-hmm. and yep. I thought but the uh, what worked for me was figuring out what the theme is at yep. the Metro Convention Center and dressing in the theme, and it was a sure thing, and well, it is today and still. I've seen the website, and I've seen some of the variations in the photos, and I've seen in the time I've known you the variations. Uh, Rhyme off a list of all the various uh, characters that. Oh, are. I've got a, a, and everyone has its own music uh, because of uh, the influence Disney. I've been down there so many times. Have, uh, had on me the theming of it, and mm-hmm. so you got to create the uh, all the senses. So I've got um, a cowboy, and it's got like a cowboy music backpack. Yeah. So I bring my own music, and with the cowboy, I learn how to do um, trick roping. Uh, I've got a toy soldier for the winter, and. Uh, again, it's got a key that revolves on the backpack and plays uh, Babes in Toyland and all those different songs. I've got a scarecrow and banjo music. I've got, um, oh, uh, at the air show, I developed an airline pilot. Uh, at, for the tall ships, I've got a sailor and a pirate uh, on stilts. The pirate has a peg leg, but it's just a wooden <laughs> stilt that I don't cover up. That's awesome. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you have to, because yeah. I'm on stilts anyways. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that one's genius. Yeah, actually. no. And I play, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean music and I have big knives or juggling knives for juggling, but I they look like a cutlass. So I juggle knives as a pirate, which is kind of cool. Now, if I'm not mistaken, one of your characters, don't they also have, uh, the hand stilts that go with it? Do you have yeah. the, the four legged, uh, the, uh that's character? the, um, and, oh man, we could go, we're going yeah. all over. I uh, wanted to finish that other story for we'll you. Get back to it. Yeah, but the uh, um, Gary Ensmaker, who makes my stilts, and he's a Bigfoot stilt company in Florida, makes them for Disney and Universal Studios, uh, made me these arm stilts and taught me how to use them. And I was done trying to make an insect or uh, yeah. something else, but I didn't have the talent to put that stuff together. So we used it on my robot character, so a four legged robot. And there's so many other things. And it's actually safer. I would think so. I use them uh, sometimes. It looks it's creepy, too. It is it, creepy, and you can't see my face. No. And uh, a lot of the equipment is uh, because I've got an interest in motorcycle, uh, motocross equipment. And I found an airbrush artist, and we, we just uh, did it right. And that's the thing with all my characters. It's not like clownish stuff or costume party stuff. It's as realistic uh, so it could be on a movie Mm -hmm. as possible. I find because you're already tall, you don't need to be a cartoon at this point. But if you can get as real... uh, In fact, um, the Brantford uh, City Police gave me a uniform Mm. for uh, their um, police week. Their police day, and so I have an actual. Police now you uniform. you would obviously lengthen the legs. Uh, yeah, I have my own pants for the things. Okay. And, uh, you know, I got a real Blue Jays outfit. So when I'm at the uh, some of the fairs in Toronto and the Blue Jays are doing well, it's a sure thing. It's a sure uh, thing. So yeah, I got different. Uh, I got like sixty five different characters. Uh, oh I'm my trying God. to, and I keep developing uh, well, new it, ones. Yeah. The idea, as you say, it's theme based, and, and anybody can just come in and clown around. It's yeah. another thing to be integrated into it. Like when I think of um, the Canada 150, I visualize you. You know, I hate to say that. It's, you know, because there's you with your flag on the stilt with your Canada 150 outfit. Yeah, I got my 1-5 outfit. Yeah. Uh, the uh, RCMP works well. The RCMP. Funny thing about that, I did Oktoberfest once. Uh, and that's the one outfit I don't have with the leader hose in the lab. Really? Uh, and I should get, but anyways, um, I thought, oh my goodness, I got booked. They're paying me. It's yeah. their opening day. And what am I going to do? So I ended up, uh, I didn't feel good about it because I always feel like I need to meet the theme. So I took the RCMP. I'll just represent. It was the best thing because everybody there who was performing uh, were from Germany. So, and they just get to do Oktoberfest and they go home. They don't get to see Canada. Yeah. So when they saw you were the, Canada, I was Canada. When they seen the RCMP there on still, they all wanted their picture with me and I was the highlight. For the whole thing. And yeah. so I was in every picture. Whereas if you had just been in Lederhosen or whatever, you would have just what blended in. What did they all do? In. Yeah. Well, they don't take a picture of a... <laughs> yeah. That we got this at home. <laughs> we had that this at home and already, so that worked out. Be taller, too. <laughs> yeah. So if you can meet the... I found, if you're meeting the theme, so a lot of the conventions, and the, when they, they usually have a, a theme, these corporate uh, parties yep. and that, it's usually a conference, and it's uh, the beginning or the end, they're having a party. And they only, they use me at the opening at the front coming in. So it's to give them that wow factor. Mm -hmm. And with me, then I'm there for half an hour to hour, whatever it takes. Usually there's a Dixie band or whatever the theme is. And then I get off the stilts and then I'm walking around doing magic, which people don't know this. It's exciting for me because in Toronto, we have some of the best magicians in the world. 
So I rub shoulders with some of the best magicians in the world and try to hold my own with them. But I'm in because they don't walk on stilts, right? So I'm right in there and learn from them. So that's the fun. Well, going, going back to the original reason as to why you got into the stilts was to stand out and, and have a unique value, you know. Uh, you mentioned the participation in the house that you wanted to recap, and then we'll get well, into the world record. That's so important to uh, my story with the, uh, the students is that I was so depressed. Uh, I remember the first day going back to work, uh, we had two residents coming down the hallway in their motorized wheelchairs. They, um, they're very expensive, and I'm the fundraiser. And um, they didn't see me at first, but what they do sometimes is they shut their eyes and go after each other as fast as possible, and the first one to open their eyes uh, is the loser, and the other one has bragging rights, right? And so they're playing chicken. <laughs> oh, my and God. And that was the time I came in, and the two guys, uh, David and Paul, were doing this, and, uh, and they were laughing and having a great time because that's who they are. Uh, great attitude. Talk about attitude. Living a challenge every day. Not the ones we've built for ourselves sometime to help others, but they were living the challenge every day, having a great time until they saw me and they could see because I've been there 20 years. They'd never seen me like this. They'd never seen me on crutches and challenged myself. And they were feeling sorry for me, I think, because what happened is they just stopped smiling, stopped laughing and just drifted away. And when I got to my office, it hit me like a bolt of lightning. So oh my God, uh, this morning I got up I had my own shower, I fed myself, and I could drive, and I have a job. These guys can't do any of that. And yet, when they took, looked at me, they're, they're saying to myself, oh, poor Doug, he hurt his knee. And it hit me like a bowl of light, and I was, oh, I'm so ashamed of myself. And that's how I went and got a 40-member team to go after the Guinness record. I met the, my physio, Tom Rollins. We went to Paris High School together, and he was working on my knee again. We got the, an orthopedic guy. Um, Dalton Orthopedics used to be in Brantford. So, and now, had you uh, hurt your leg at this point? Yeah, I had hurt, and I'd been away two weeks. Uh, I'd been to the physio, and then I was on my feet with crutches. And uh, although um, I wasn't walking on stilts, I thought that career was over. I still had my job, and yet uh, just a bad knee. And here we have people that were born with cerebral palsy, no fault of their own, uh, living a life of challenges, feeling sorry for me. And that's what turned me around. And that's how we started going after the Guinness World Record because uh, my physio and I decided, okay, we got to turn this around, make it a fundraiser, and let's get back on stilts. And the best way to get back on stilts is go on the world's tallest one. Might, might as well. <laughs> right, right. And uh, so that led us on the journey towards that record. Uh, we tried. Uh, there was a few people I wanted on the team. Um, most of them were enthusiastic, and they energized our whole team. Uh, they knew how to fail forward because we failed many times. But a few of them thought I was an idiot. And I tell the students, those guys that thought I was an idiot, they thought, you're only five foot five. You're old, old at that time, <laughs> in my 40s. And, and injured. And injured, yeah, and no ACL. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking? You're an idiot. Well, I tell the kids, uh, those people didn't get on the team and didn't break the record. So that was, that was my point I, on that. I've, I've learned a long time ago that, that when you're doing something outrageous like that, you got to believe it. You know, it's, it had the belief is half of it. And, you know, even, e even if the truth is you'll fail, you got to believe. Well, you know. we didn't know. And if we yeah. hadn't failed, a guy by the name of David Van Alexander, who was watching us, a friend of Bob Phillips, a Kuhn Engineering, was asking Bob, why are you using aluminum? Uh, because that's the only thing they could get donated. He says, you need carbon fiber or something. Yes, um, 11,000 bucks. So uh, after one of my failed attempts at the Civic Center, I think it was the 125 uh, sesquicentennial for Brantford at the Civic Center. I got down, and Dave says, um, here's my registration to be on your team. And he gave me an $11,000 check to get the carbon fiber. And uh, so it's, it's that kind of story. So if we hadn't been failing and we hadn't been trying, like I said earlier, you um, don't count yourself out before you even try, uh, we wouldn't have got where we did. Yeah. And so my, 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 the whole thing is you're a winner when you try. I mean, the, the end result, you'll get the record. And when I was interviewed, they said, oh, you were a big failure when I failed a couple of times. See, KCO TV said, oh, you're a big failure. What do you got to say for yourself? Oh, no, we made $30,000 that day as a fundraiser. We had more people show up and more aware of participation house that day. I don't think we're a failure. I think we're a winner. In fact, as far as what you're talking about, the Guinness record, uh, we're going to try again. So we're, we're, we're not done. Mm -hmm. I didn't say we were done. Yeah. So then, you know, and I tell kids... If um, at the high schools, if I hadn't got the record when I did and I didn't have it, I'd be telling you, I'm working on this Guinness World Record. I'm 62. 
but I'm going to get that. <laughs> well, has yeah. anybody challenged it since? Yeah, many people have and say they have it, and they get it on the first try. Uh, but if you look at the how they did it and you look at their pictures or their uh, video, you'll see that they have an overhead line. So I call them the world's tallest marionettes because mm-hmm. they haven't figured out um, how we did it. Yes. And they thought that's the only way to do it. Was to, but to if re- you, reduce a bit of the gravity of you. Yeah, they're yeah. pulling them up and it's yeah. like belaying. And so we well, you're did a it. marionette at this point. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> why I call it. That's another record, yeah. I guess. So we yeah. did it. We did have safety because uh, Guinness won't recognize you if you kill yourself. Yeah, well, you, you had to, a cable on each side. But yeah. originally when you were practicing, uh, because we didn't mention it, well, you were doing it in a silo, if I'm right. not mistaken. So maybe, maybe uh, you just walk me through the setup. Oh, well, uh, we had failed a couple of times at the Civic Center. And we, so... Yeah. Uh, Zig Ziglar, he mm-hmm. passed away uh, a few months ago. He used to say, if you keep trying the same thing, you'll get the same results. So we had to figure out something else. We went to Tom Pate at Brantwood Farm and said, we need your 80-foot silo, uh, the practice. And he said, well, take it away, but bring it back when you're done. But we, we got a concrete floor in there. We put up scaffolding. We had the team of 40 people. Uh, I couldn't remember all their names, or I mean I do, but it take us all day mm-hmm. to talk. But anyways, I had a they good team. They know who they are. They know who they are. We'll have a reunion yeah. one day. Uh, we put all the scaffolding in there, and we went up there, and we, we put two lines, uh, uh, the safety about 50 lines. feet, yeah. uh, two lines to hold on to. And we actually broke the record uh, in there at 50 feet, 5 inches. Back in 98, um, it was recorded with Guinness, and then the guy that had the record before me, his name was Daddy Eddie Wolf from Wisconsin, said, well, that's an indoor record. And so uh, he appealed it, so that's why we, after that, we did it outside, but there was two reasons we did it at the um, tourism center. The two big reasons. One is when we did it in the silo, we had a lot of supporters that couldn't get in there because the silo's only so big. We just yep. had our team in there. We had um, Chris Friel, who was the mayor at the time, to verify it, and we had um, we had another stilt walker there, Arlene Thomas, who was a stilt walker to verify it. That's what Guinness Guinness will send people, but it costs you thousands yeah. of dollars. And our idea is, no, it's not spending money. Mm-hmm. We'll do it the other way. Um, so we needed to do it outside, and when the um, tourism center, uh, you'll re- I don't know if... This was before this me, is, but uh, the tourism center had just been built. There's a lot of controversy yeah, around that, uh, as you remember, and a lot of negative things, and at the time... the Still late, to this day. Yes. Uh, the late Susan Sager was... Oh, uh, Susan. Yeah, okay, you remember Susan? Oh, I know Susan. Um, she was having a rough time, and I said, Susan, let's work together on this. Let's make this positive. And one of the problems is people said, no, we won't know where it is. I says, what if you had me up on the 50-foot poles waving at the highway? So that's how that started. And Dave Levac was a big supporter at the time, and um, the mayor and a, a few other people. So at the opening of the tourism center, uh, we made that part of the, uh, the activities. And you, Jordan Zoke was mm-hmm. there uh, jumping over Volkswagens and stuff. And uh, I don't know if the people knew that. But anyways... Uh, we we did it there for Susan and to give a, a positive support to the tourism center. It gave us the outdoor record. We had the television covering it, and uh, and it was a rainy, cold, windy day, and so I didn't get as many steps, but you needed 25 forward unassisted steps. So we did it in front of everybody, so... It, it was uh, done. It was done. Yeah. And now those stilts are in the tourism building. Yeah, to this day, yeah. plus the two uh, certificates. So we have the uh, record for the heaviest stilts ever mastered and the tallest for... There's other records for tallest for 10 steps or something. We got the 25 So steps. the heaviest one, was that with the old aluminum? No, no, no. So this is with the carbon fiber. So, so The aluminum I never broke. They right. would have been by far the heaviest yeah. stilts because they ended up weighing 125 pounds each, but I couldn't get a step out of those. Well, maybe talk to me about that because you told me about the frustration of that thing where you're, you're, most of us would probably fall just standing on the stuff. So to put it in context, you're 80 odd feet high. Uh, well, 50 feet on yeah. these... Um, these uh, the the original ones, the, um, the aluminum, yeah. they were donated by um, Hunter Steel and put together oaks. And I remember the picture the night before. My wife and I held up the middle part of them, uh, and the two ends were still touching the ground. Yeah, so, uh, so People don't a, realize how the rubbery they are, the bend in them. And uh, Bob Phillips, he's still with Cahoon Engineering to this day. He looks like he's on stilts. He's like 6'8". But... Uh, he, uh, it was embarrassing to get my picture with him because I'm supposed to be the tallest guy and I, I didn't even come up to his <laughs> belly button. But anyways, uh, he was worried. And so was Paul Creighton with Cooper's Crane. Because uh, he's, that, that they've never, there's no the... um, engineering at that point no. for holding a person. They've done like bridging yeah. and different things. So he was concerning how that would uh, would work. 
And you're not necessarily a, a, a stable element up at that, no, at that height. No, no, it was you know, windy and... Uh, in fact, uh, oh my gosh, there was a lot of things. People don't know what happened behind the scenes. Even practicing at the silo, um, I fainted in there. I couldn't get down from the scaffolding because uh, there's no tie down. Or? There's chemicals in there uh, and exhaustion, and I got sick, and uh, there was no way to get down. Did you so puke I, from the top down? No, I because did. Because that would have been funny. I certainly uh, they needed umbrellas because I'd sweat so much I and get so that. angry. But uh, there was one time I just had to have a little sleep up there for an hour before I could climb did, down. What did you do? Just lean, lean on something at that point? Uh, well, there was like uh, boards on top ah, of the scaffold, gotcha. and I stayed up there with Todd Pipe, who was my safety guy, and I said, okay, you can't climb down now. And I think what he did is he tied me, and I went down with a rope down. But we had a lot of challenges. One time we were up there in a thunderstorm happened from nowhere let's get the heck down <laughs> yeah so uh yeah a lot of different things happened uh, with that so it sort of took part of her i had to turn down a lot of gigs uh, we we made this um uh, i had to get up uh 5 30 every morning go to the willet hospital at the time and train with tom rollins we had my regular stilts we put like uh, weights on them to try and lift them we um there was a pool in town we used stilts with flutter boards on it to try and mimic that there's a lot of different things we were committed we were going to do this well in the early days uh, of your thought, you probably saw it as a strength over, you know, mass to get started. Because I remember you telling me you're standing there and you go to lift your leg and, or you know. Well, or, yeah, if you're an engineer, people talk to me, okay, how did you do that? Because that's impossible. Well, we don't want to give away the secret too well, much. but I could uh, lift, well, I'll give away the secret, hmm. but I could lift the uh, stilt straight up. But in order to drive that bottom foot forward, it is impossible. Well, so you're, you're looking yeah. at just the leverage of the, your ankle is doing the only pivot. Yeah, there, of, there's no way. Even when I was holding the lines, there's no way. And uh, when you see these other guys uh, challenging my record, and they have uh, this overhead line, and they seem to be making these beautiful steps, it's a, something's going, that's yeah. not right. So um, we actually um, got my steps on a wobble. Because when you drive those stilts down, they wobble. And um, between three or four of us, we found videoing down below and up above what was happening. Hey, and it, it happened when I got angry because I drive mm. the stilts on the ground like a spoiled little boy. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's yeah. not happening. And then, then they said, oh, that's good. You got to step in. What do you mean I got to step in? <laughs> and so and it was backwards and forwards. So you find when you wobble that stilt, there's a slow wobble that goes down that shaft. And the bottom toe, I call it, would not go in the same position that you started with. So then uh, Tom Rollins had a crowbar, and he would bang it against the scaffolding, and he found a rhythm that worked. And so it was like riding a horse on these stilts when I, um, in a crouched position, if I started falling back, I'd stand up. And when I fell forward, I'd sit down. And then the sideways was easy. And then I pound the stilts, and uh, after three months, we found we could get some forward steps. So it took a few months to get more now, this is after the failure where you're basically on display at the Civic, Civic Center? Civic Center, yeah. yeah. We just said and we'd do it. So so you had not uh, achieved a step on the first uh, no. prior to the first attempt. You hadn't figured it out. You, you just, we're going to figure it out today. No, I couldn't. Well, they were 125 pounds and yeah. everything. They, they were bending. We were, um, we call bridging, like the, the, the Golden Gate Bridge and stuff to try to make them sturdy, but then they were too heavy. And... Uh, uh, Gary in Florida thought I needed the harness that I was wearing over my shoulder, the lift, and that took my balance totally away. So the one uh, day we had him over at the silo, I cut everything off. I got frustrated. I'm going to cut this off, do uh, stilt walking like I know stilt walking. And, uh, and that gave us uh, the next step was to make them wobble, and then the next step was to balance on that wobble. And it took a lot of, I was younger then, but I tell you, it was a workout. Oh, we, yeah, it was a workout to do it, and it, it was frustrating at times when we could get some steps. And that's now, how we did it. Were you able to get the steps with the aluminum, or did you need the carbon for that? No, nothing happened with the aluminum. So you and got that's when no Dave motion. was watching. He says, you know, you can't do with those. you got, you got to have the right tools. So, so it wasn't as much of the lightness of, of the carbon fiber in this case. There was probably other aspects of it in terms of it, the bands and all that stuff. Yeah, well, yeah. they were a lot lighter, yeah. 60 pounds, and they were hollow. But I, and the wobble was perfect for what we needed to do, yeah. and we discovered that by chance, I guess. Yeah. And uh, so... Well, the nice thing with carbon fiber, and I know this, you know, from racing and whatnot, is they're great hitting it one way. 
you know, and so if that thing's architected to be an extension of your leg, and and you can orchestrate that, whereas aluminum, that's I don't want to no, say it's a living, all over the place. Yeah, it's, it's not a living metal per se, but well, we ended up with that because we didn't want to spend any money because the whole idea at the original idea was, was for it was Paul a and David. <laughs> yeah, it was for them. So we didn't want to take any of the money that, that was a community. We had names all over these stilts. We had different ways of fundraising, but it was to go to Paul and David. That yeah. was the whole idea. So we had to figure out another way, and so. Uh, we had to do it through donations, so thank God for Dave seeing that we're struggling and knowing that the aluminum was no good, and uh, Bob Phillips had found a carbon fiber in Montreal, but they wouldn't uh, donate it because they had nothing to do with us. But a guy in Stony Creek makes sailboat masts. He had uh, catamarans, tech composites uh, made, the, and I remember going up there with my brother bringing these poles home on his truck. But anyways, that's uh, that's the story. <laughs> that's wow. my story. <laughs> Wow, that, that is spectacular. Yeah. So all of this leads us right back to, to the cause, the story for anybody that, that is listening to it. It's a great story. Is there anything you want to add before we uh, call it a wrap? Uh, no, I think, you know, a um, lot of people think what I do um, is abnormal. Uh, and, however, if it should be. It's not there. If you look in the dig- dictionary under abnormal, you should see another word that says exceptional. So... You know, if you're going to be normal, you're never going to break a Guinness record or get on a podcast. You have you just, to wait, be... wait. You just put my podcast on the same bar as a Guinness World Record. <laughs> you were, you're Thank there, you. Man. Thank you. I'll remember that forever. <laughs> because you have to do uh, abnormal or exceptional things. But don't be abnormal like Charlie Sheen was for a while. <laughs> uh, a... You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You need to be, when you're helping others, you can be abnormal to help others. That's what makes you exceptional. So we made uh, $75,000 being abnormal. That's a good thing. It got a lot of press. It got a lot of awareness. Uh, we called it the still, the world record stilt attempt team, not uh, in support of uh, Doug. It was in support of uh, participation House PSS now. And so anything you do, when you help others, you help yourself. Look at me. I'm uh, still on stilts. I was in the last uh, uh, Santa Claus parade here in Brantford, uh, 62. I'm still hopping around, still doing well. And it all happened because I wanted to help others. But, you know, in helping others, I really did help myself. Well, you said it right at the beginning when we were talking about where your job is every day. You know, you've right. been surrounded by... Um, a certain vibe, for lack of a better term, your entire life. And it just plays off of each other and I think it just makes you better and better and better. And better. Yeah. Like it's a feedback loop, I guess is the word, but it's a good feedback loop. Whereas to your point, when you were at your lowest, you were surrounded by people that in your, in reality, in some cases have a much harder life than us. And we're like, as you say, like when I interviewed Walter, you know, the yeah. biggest, the biggest thing from that one was acknowledging the fact that he was the grateful one, not the great one. Ah, okay. That's good. Yeah. Oh, hey, come on. Yeah. Without that accident, without that, that life altering story, you know, now he's fallen asleep in my car. So it's, I've yeah. heard the stories over and over again, but you know, relearning how to shower, having a list in your shower versus a list beside your bed and step through everything, starting from beginning. I never knew Walter prior to that. I've always known Walter the current Walter, right? And, you know, obviously it's a bit worse now with the health and all yes. that, but you know, the, the post, uh, incident, uh, right. Walter, it made him who he is now more so than ever. I think he is yeah. just every day grateful. And I think it's part of that feedback loop. He goes, then takes that, goes into the community, whether or not it's at the McDonald's for his free, sure. uh, free, uh, yeah. flopjacks, if that's still the case or whatever it is, but the list goes on. Uh, yeah. It, it plays into it. And I think you would not be, who you are now, as you say, if it was not for your sister, right. if it was not for your day-to-day job, if it was not for your love of the community, and, and I'll put in a plug, if it was not for your wife. Yeah, thank you. You know what I mean?